In this video, we're going to be looking at the epoxide ring opening reaction using a base to do the ring opening. In case you're not familiar with the term epoxide, this is an epoxide. It's a three-membered ring. It's a cyclic ether, so it has one oxygen atom and two carbon atoms on it, and it may have some substituents attached to the carbon atoms as well. In this reaction, we literally open the ring. So the two carbon atoms of the epoxide ring end up like this, and the oxygen of the epoxide ends up right here. And whatever base we're using to do the ring opening, it attaches itself to one of the two carbon atoms of the epoxide. There are five bases that are commonly used for this reaction, alkoxides, cyanide, SH-, the hydride ion, which would come as LAH. So if you have the hydride ion as your base, you're probably not gonna see step one H-, you're probably gonna see step one LAH, and you just have to know that LAH really means hydride. And then last but not least, an R-, minus, which is probably gonna be coming as a Grignard reagent. So over here, step one would be something like CH, H3 MGBR, and you would know that that meant your base was CH3 minus. Let's take a look at the mechanism for this reaction. I've got a specific epoxide down here. I've got a lot of stuff attached to the ring and I've got some stereochemistry so we can see a pretty tricky example. And the base that we're using here is cyanide. Now in this particular reaction, this reaction is very SN2-like, which means that the base, we know the base is gonna be attacking one of the two carbon atoms of the epoxide. And because this is an SN2-like reaction, our base is gonna be attacking the carbon atom that is the least sterically hindered. So let's make a note of that. Base attacks the least sterically hindered carbon. And we want to take a look at our epoxide that we're working with here and figure out which one of the two is the least sterically hindered. This carbon atom has got um, two alkyl groups on it, and then it's part of the ring. This carbon atom has one alkyl group and one hydrogen, and it's also part of the ring. This alkyl or this carbon atom, because it has a hydrogen on it, it is the least sterically hindered of the two. So for this particular reaction, the cyanide is going to be attacking at this carbon. So let's go ahead and draw that step in the mechanism. Now, because this is SN2 like, when the cyanide attacks, we're going to be breaking a bond to make room for that cyanide. The bond that breaks is always going to be the carbon oxygen bond. This is the ring opening part of the reaction. So let's start drawing the products of this reaction over here. We've got the two carbon atoms from the epoxide. Here's our oxygen atom. It now has a, a, an extra lone pair of electrons on it. When this bond breaks, the bonding electrons go onto the oxygen atom as a lone pair. So now it has a, a negative formal charge. This carbon atom of the ring, we didn't do anything to that carbon atom, which means that there has been no change to it and no change to the stereochemistry at that carbon. But what about what's going on over here? So we know over here we've added the cyanide, we still have the hydrogen and the methyl group. Since this is an SN2-like reaction, not only is our base attacking the least sterically hindered carbon, it is also causing inversion of stereochemistry just like SN2. Now, we have to be really careful about how we communicate that inverted stereochemistry for our product over here. When it's time for us to actually draw the stereochemistry on this carbon, we really, really need to be careful about how we go about communicating that. There are two different ways that you could draw the inverted stereochemistry at this carbon. And I think personally, for me, the easiest way to draw it is, you know, as I'm thinking about the mechanism of this reaction, I'm thinking about how cyanide comes up from underneath, underneath the oxygen. So my cyanide is going to end up right here on the molecule. And, and if I do that, the cyanide ends up down here. My methyl group and my hydrogen, we know they're going to be kind of pushed up a little bit. But in terms of being on a wedge or being on a dash, that is not going to change. So the hydrogen is still going to be on the dash and the methyl group is still going to be on the wedge. They're just going to be kind of pushed up a little bit to make room for the cyanide. So this would be one proper way to communicate the stereochemistry at this particular carbon atom. Another option that you have that I don't really think is an easy way to think about it, 
So another option that you would have, let's redraw this guy, would be to literally invert, I forgot my propyl there, so literally invert the stereochemistry your, in terms of your wedge and your dash. If you do that, however, you've got to put the cyanide or whatever the base is, you have to put that particular bond in the same position as the original carbon oxygen bond. And like I said, I feel like this, at least for me, this is not quite as intuitive. I don't, I don't really like to do it that way. So I like to think about it this way because my brain is thinking about the mechanism and thinking about the placement of the cyanide ion and thinking about the fact that these substituents are just being pushed upwards, but they're not changing from wedge to dash or from dash to wedge. So I like this method right here. Uh, after this particular step of the reaction, don't forget we have step two, H2O, and you can probably anticipate what's going to happen in this step because we have that O minus. All that we're trying to do here is protonate, and that's going to leave us with, we'll clean the molecule up a little bit, make it look a little bit prettier. I don't know why I wrote CH down here. It's a CN. There's our wedge hydrogen. Here's our OH group and our ethyl, and our propyl, and there's the product of the reaction.